Right, we're going to read uh, from 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 6, where, as you see, it's uh, verse seven, uh, chapter 7 and verse 1 that we're going to be considering particularly, uh, but we need to look at what uh, leads up to that. And as so often is the case in Scripture, that uh, the... Um, Yes, so often in Scripture you find that the chapter divisions are not always that helpful, and that's the case here, uh, particularly as uh, chapter 7 and verse 1 begins, therefore, what has gone before is most important in this particular case. Just before we read uh, from chapter 6 and verse 14 of 2 Corinthians, let's have a word of prayer. Father, as we consider these words together again tonight, we pray, Lord, that you will help us and that you will speak to us through the Scriptures. Thank you, Lord, that they have been divinely inspired. And therefore, Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit uh, will take the very words that he inspired in the first place and apply them to our hearts and lives. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14. Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what is a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell in them and will walk among them, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God." During the week I've been uh, thinking about one or two things basically as a result of an email that was sent to me and uh, uh, examining one or two matters and then I also read in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 uh, something that links in with this very much and uh, I I found this uh, passage therefore very much on my mind. It's quite interesting actually that just those verses that I I read almost stand on their own. It, uh, what has gone before doesn't particularly fit in, although there are uh, other links in one way or another, uh, particularly that uh, he appeals to them to be reconciled to God. Uh, there, in, um, earlier on in, that, uh, in this chapter, uh, it seems that perhaps sin has crept in. Certainly, some seem to be critical of the Apostle. Uh, but what he's coming to now is the fact that really, in many ways, they've been living lax lives. And they have perhaps not been that careful about associations and relationships, and uh, really been separate to the Lord as they should have been. It begins there in verse 14 about not being bound together or unequally yoked, as the authorized version has it. And that would probably be a slightly more uh, literal translation. And of course, uh, Paul has in mind something that is there in the Old Testament in uh, Deuteronomy 22 and verse 10. You shall not plow with an ox and donkey. I think most of us can see the wisdom of that. Two animals that are, are different in size and perhaps strength, uh, they probably end up going around in circles rather than plowing the field. So it wouldn't be very wise to use two separate uh, animals. But it's quite interesting, particularly there in Deuteronomy uh, 22 and uh, then verse 11, it talks about other mixtures. And as a reminder for us, and I think therefore it's quite appropriate that he should take this idea of uh, of a mixture of animals uh, and a mixture even uh, of uh, fabrics, uh, because uh, they wouldn't always marry up that well. Just imagine wool and cotton. I imagine... uh, the wool will shrink much quicker than, uh, than cotton, and therefore it's not a very good idea to use those, that sort of mixture. But God is against mixture. And really, here's this idea again of mixture. 
that which is spiritual with that which is carnal or even that which is demonic. So the Apostle Paul starts at this particular point. Of course it's always been applied or usually applied to the matter of marriage. Uh, not being unequally yoked with an unbeliever. Because obviously there are different standards, uh, different philosophies, different concepts about life. And certainly from the point of view of uh, believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, vastly different ideas. And uh, those conflicts there of ideas uh, could obviously result in a, a conflict within marriage. But I'm not sure that the Apostle Paul is altogether touching on the matter of marriage. I think it's much wider than that. Uh, he's talking about fellowship and partnership with unbelievers generally. Uh, and what we would call uh, just, well, fellowship really, basically. And probably at the back of his mind, too, is this matter of participation in pagan feasts. The matter there about the temple of God and uh, uh, as they are, uh, and uh, that of idols once again has come to the fore. And we know, of course, in the first letter that Paul actually is dealing with it for uh, uh, three chapters, from chapter 8 right the way through chapter 10. He diverts a bit uh, in one or two places, but that's basically what it's all about. He speaks a great deal about freedom, and he says, I'm not going to use my freedom in a way that hurts somebody else. I'm not going to participate with food sacrifice to idols when I know an idol is nothing, but it may actually hinder somebody else if I do so. So even my freedom I'm going to limit because I don't want to harm somebody else. So this is probably something of the background. But I think it's quite interesting the contrasts that are there in those uh, five verses from 14 to 18. First of all, he talks about believers and unbelievers and uh, being joined together. Uh, do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship is light with darkness? Or what harmony is Christ with Belial? Or what is a believer in common with an unbeliever? And so on. And this picture very much of uh, two animals being yoked together and being unequally yoked. Being joined together, he talks about here. Uh, it just doesn't really make sense. And therefore we need to be careful even in our relationships with unbelievers. That doesn't mean to say we should befriend them. Uh, Jesus was known as a friend of sinners. But we always need to be careful that as we befriend people, we are not dragged down to their level. And that can so often happen. Even in trying to win them, we can perhaps compromise a bit in trying to bring them to faith in Christ. And then he talks about righteousness and lawlessness. Righteousness doing the right thing. Living as God would want us to. Lawlessness, of course, as far as the Bible is concerned, is refusing to live by the instruction of God. Because uh, Torah basically is, uh, yes, a law, but it's instruction first and foremost. It's God's instruction. So on the one hand, you have a believer who wants to live a righteous life because they have come under the instruction of God. They've come under the lordship of uh, Jesus Christ. They want to go his way. But on the other hand, there are those who totally ignore uh, the word of God. Uh, and he saw, says there, uh, for what partnership of righteousness and lawlessness? It seems to me that even in the business world, we need to be very careful as a believer not to be involved in partnership with an unbeliever. Uh, if you're running the company jointly together, again, there would be different standards. And the danger is that we will compromise if we're a believer. Or on the other hand, that conflict will, will arise. We need to recognize there are differences in uh, us who are believers to the rest of the world. And then he talks about light and darkness. And uh, for us, that's quite obvious, isn't it? The difference between light and darkness. We can see it uh, uh, so easily. A uh, room can be plunged in darkness and then we put on the light and the darkness is dispelled. Uh, we would want that to happen, of course, in the lives of others. But he says, what fellowship can there be? Is there any fellowship between light and darkness? 
Of course not. We know that very clearly. And then he talks about Christ and Belial. Uh, Belial in the Old uh, Testament uh, was often translated as worthless person. But it went on then in a worthless person who meant basically somebody who was wicked. Uh, who was going uh, the wrong way altogether. And then in the intertestamental uh, period between the Old and the New Testament, it often was used of Satan himself. And certainly here in the Greek world, Aphrodite was often uh, linked with uh, Belial. So we say what, what is common between Christ and uh, satanic forces? There's nothing at all uh, to be compared. There can be no harmony. Actually, the Greek word is uh, symphone, uh, from which obviously we get symphony. So harmony, I think, is a pretty good translation. Uh, we often say, say that people aren't singing from the same hymn sheet. Well, certainly Christ and Belial won't be singing from the same hymn sheet. Uh, their aims are altogether different. Satan wants to destroy, Jesus came to save. So really, this uh, puts the thing very clearly. If Christ is in us, how can we have real deep fellowship? Uh, how can we have real harmony with somebody who is going Satan's way or the world's way? And then it talks about a believer and an unbeliever. What do they really have in common? What share or portion could they have in common? What estate could they um, well, maintain, uh, organize? There certainly is no, nothing in common between them. And then, of course, the temple of God and the idols. What agreement can there be? What alliance? And we know, really, there can be no agreement between the temple of God and to idols. We shall be seeing that something of this working out uh, a little bit later as we look at some of the practical applications, but here the Apostle Paul is making it abundantly clear we as Christians need to be separate from and not to get involved in such a way that our walk with Christ is being hindered. And it can very easily. Again, let me just say that we should be trying to reach out to, to people who are not saved. We should be trying to reach those in other faiths. But we need to be careful that we don't try to build up some agreement between those of other faiths. But it goes on about our position in Christ. And uh, these uh, verses are, are, are very encouraging, aren't they? He begins by saying that uh, we're the temple of the living God. We're the temple of the living God. The temple of the Holy Spirit, if you like. Paul has already applied this in his previous letter in two different ways. In 1 Corinthians 3, he applied it of the church. That we together, as we meet together, God is amongst us. We're his temple. He indwells his church. But then just a couple of chapters later, he reminds us that our physical bodies, not the, the body of Christ, but our physical bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And he's using that in terms of immorality. And of course in Corinth there was a great deal of immorality. Uh, seaports are usually uh, rather immoral places. Uh, particularly having come from Portsmouth, uh, that was often the, the case uh, with naval men being there. Uh, uh, immorality was rife in some quarters, as it would be in other places. And Corinth had really a port on either side. It was just on a small isthmus in between. Uh, so it was a major port and a major place of immorality as well. Uh, but uh, again, we just need to remember that we're the temple of the Holy Spirit, whether physically ourselves or uh, as the, the body of Christ, as the church. I think, therefore, we might just remind ourselves, too, that we need to make sure that we do use our bodies in a, in a good way. I think even in a healthy way. Uh, we don't want to, uh, well, put undue stress or cause uh, problems, uh, medical problems, uh, because we're not taking care of our body. Obvious example, we know that smoking now is very dangerous uh, for the body. If our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, if He's indwelling us, we need to take care of our physical bodies. <clears throat> 
but he goes on to point out too that uh, uh, God's presence and we're, uh, is with us and we're his people. He quotes from, uh, from Exodus chapter 29 and verse 45. I will dwell in them and walk among them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. It's a reminder that actually as the children of Israel, right in the center of their camp was the tabernacle. God wanted to be there at the center of their life. That's very true too of our nation. God would want to be the center of our life. But we've chosen to reject him. But just the way the camp was laid out, there was the, uh, the tabernacle in the center and then the various uh, uh, tribes round about. Uh, Judah, I think, was to the north. And uh, so they set their camp out in that sort of way. Uh, the tabernacle was there amongst them. God had wanted to dwell amongst them. He wants to be amongst us. That's why he sends his Holy Spirit. And you might say too that he's quoted from Ezekiel 37, which is almost the same. And with Ezekiel 37, at the end of that chapter is that uh, God is now again at the center of their lives. God will uh, visit them. He will give them a new heart and a new spirit. Uh, they will be cleansed from their sin. And again, he will dwell amongst them. But here's the Apostle Paul reminding us as believers that God wants to be right amongst us. If he is right amongst us, then we ought to be very careful just with how we associate with other people. And then this one is very interesting. In, uh, he quotes there from Isaiah 52 and verse 11. Do not touch what is unclean. And I will welcome you, rather, sorry, the um, bit before. Come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean. It's worth actually looking at uh, the Old Testament passage there, uh, because very simply, he's saying to the priest in particular, as uh, now they're talking about uh, restoring Jerusalem uh, and uh, captivity coming to an end, uh, and then therefore coming out of Babylon, out of captivity, he says, depart, depart, go out from there, touch nothing unclean, get out of the midst of her, purify yourself, you who carry the vessels of the Lord. But you will not go out in haste, nor you will go out as fugitives, for the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel will be your uh, rear guard. Those who were going to carry the vessels of the Lord, they needed to be very careful they did not bring anything that uh, was a Babylon, if we can put it that way. So easily to syncretize. And how sad to say, that's been part of the problem of the Catholic Church all down the ages. And perhaps there's a danger for all of us in one sense, just to sort of take on some of the other standards. The Catholic Church has done it very often in order to try to bring people in. That's not the way it's to be done. We have to leave behind those things that are wrong. So here was a very clear warning for the priest. And I think it's got application for us too. That when we really do come to follow the Lord, we make sure that we leave behind anything that is spiritually unclean. That would be a hindrance to us. And then he goes on to say, and I will welcome you. And I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. I think we can very quickly take on that verse without remembering what has gone before. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will uh, uh, come out from their midst and be separate. Isn't that what repentance is all about? It's a matter of leaving behind those things that are wrong. And when we do repent and come in faith in the, to the Lord Jesus Christ, God becomes a father to us. The Holy Spirit adopts us into his family so that we start to cry, Abba, Father. On Father's Day, it's good to remember that we do have a Heavenly Father. But, you know, I'm a little bit against just using the Lord's Prayer, excuse me, putting it this way willy-nilly, because I don't think... Somebody can say, our Father, unless he is Father, God is Father. And it means that we have come in repentance, and we've come in faith. And then the Holy Spirit is, a, uh, is that spirit of adoption that's brought us into God's family. God has actually uh, 
entered within us by His Holy Spirit, so that then we can really know God as Father. Incidentally, I think the Lord's Prayer uh, it does say uh, in one of the Gospels, after this manner pray. And I think it's much more an agenda for prayer, the sort of things we should be praying about, uh, rather than being uh, repeating it by rote. But that's uh, another matter. But isn't it tremendous? God says, as you leave behind those things, as you come in repentance, as you come in faith, I will be a father, and you'll be a son and a daughter to me. We've already speculated or thought about today, uh, you know, we may have good fathers, and some of us are very grateful that we've had uh, good fathers. I certainly am grateful for my upbringing. Uh, my dad wasn't perfect any more than I've been perfect. Uh, uh, perhaps that's part of the trouble. Of the son of Adam's passed right the way down through all of us. But, uh, but we do have one heavenly father who is absolutely perfect. And he says, you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Fancy having the Almighty God, the creator of this world, as our Father. And he says, you will be sons and daughters to me. What a relationship to have. And it's really on the basis of that that he goes on to say that we should cleanse ourselves. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the, in the, um, in the fear of the Lord, or the fear of God. Because of these promises, that God would dwell amongst us, that when we do leave behind the unclean thing, He welcomes us, that we're the temple of the living God, and that He will be a Father to us. What a tremendous thing. I wonder how much we really do reflect on that. Alright, we've sung Amazing Grace tonight, and uh, every time we sing it, uh, we do remind ourselves that the, that grace that God has shown to us has been absolutely amazing. But what a family to be adopted into. What a, what a God. Uh, to adopt us by faith. So having these these promises of what God will do for us. Incidentally, uh, I was given a present today by one Lord grandson, and uh, as he gave me his present, he said afterwards, "What have you got for me?" <laughs> uh, well, uh, I don't have anything for him. I have to say, but no, we can't say that to God, can we? We give to him, and we, he's always giving in abundance to us. Thank God. These marvelous promises then. So we need to cleanse ourselves uh, from all defilement. Uh, the word for cleanse here is very much to do with from stains, from dirt. We need to cleanse ourselves. We need to purify ourselves. Uh, we need to purge ourselves from all uncleanness. Um, we, the Greek word we get here is, from, uh, is catharsis, which does have a, 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 mean of, a means of healing as well behind it. So we seek to be cleansed from sin so that, as it were, that, that gap, that wound, that, uh, uh, um, or that sin in our lives is somehow closed up. Because when we say sorry to God, we're really saying, I, I, I want to have victory here. And yet we, I wonder how many times we really say that. Or are we just saying, Lord, I failed again. I'm sorry, I'll probably fail again. And that's sometimes a bit of our attitude, isn't it? But this word has the idea of, of really dealing with sin, really getting rid of it. And then it talks about defilement here. Uh, cleanse ourselves from all defilement. Again, it's got the ideas of uh, stains, of pollution. But the Greek word that is used here is not a matter of ceremony that, uh, remember in the Old Testament, if you've touched a dead body, you need to be cleansed, you need to be purified. There's some, uh, some virtue in that, of course, because we know full well that really if you've handled a dead body, we've only got to think of a bowler. Uh, we really do need to make sure that uh, that's been thoroughly dealt with. Uh, and so even in the instruction there of God uh, for the, the, the Jews, there was obviously virtue in recognizing that if they handled a dead body, they needed to be cleansed. But there were other things 
uh, and some of the traditions that are crept in, like washing of hands, uh, not just because we, we see it as a hygienic thing to do, but having come from the marketplace and so on, they were looking to, as it were, cleanse themselves from, from defilements ceremonially. This isn't the case here. It's dealing with real defilement that has been talked about. And it talks about flesh and spirit. And I guess it's talking about physical as well as spiritual things. Again, we, if we think back to 1 Corinthians uh, 10, uh, the Jews having come out of, his, uh, out of Egypt uh, before very long were engaging in immorality and idolatry. And the two went together. You may remember Baal of Peor and how Balaam uh, trapped Israel into really receiving something of the curse of God because of their disobedience. Well, uh, both aspects uh, are very often linked together. And uh, again, we'll find that when we look at a verse in uh, Revelation. And then it talks about perfecting or completing holiness. Completing. It's the end of a process, the word, the, the Greek word that is used there. And uh, I don't think we become perfect overnight, do we? Uh, in one sense, we never become perfect the side of, uh, uh, of glory. But there should be a progression. We should become more and more uh, perfect people, more holy, living for him more and more, and living that more righteous life. And we're to do so in the fear of the Lord, that reverence for God. I think today we've lost something of that reverence and awe for God. Here is a holy God, and therefore we need to be holy as well. In fact, that's a command of God. Be ye holy as I am holy, uh, to quote uh, 1 Peter 2 from the AV. That's the trouble, most of the verses I learnt in the AV, uh, but um, well, whether you use a modern translation or not, the command is still the same, that we're to be holy. Well, what about some of the application? We can take some of the scriptures and then begin to think around them. Uh, first of all, one of the things I saw in, uh, was, uh, I had been reading, as I said, in 1 Corinthians 8, and the two things seemed to square up a bit. Because the word defilement was uh, mentioned there. Um, or defiled. However, not all men have uh, this knowledge. That, that is, that idols are simply uh, uh, demonic forces. They're not really gods at all. He says, not all people have this knowledge. But some accustomed to the idol until now eat food as it were sacrificed to an idol. And their conscience being weak is defiled. Uh, but food will not commend us to God. We are neither worse or uh, if we eat, uh, nor better if we do not uh, eat. But then he goes on to talk about uh, using our liberty and not being a stumbling block to others. But the problem is if uh, a young Christian who's come out of idolatry sees a Christian participating in pagan feasts, they might think they're all right and then find that their spiritual lives become contaminated again. That they're being drawn back into wrong influences. I'm not sure that we're always that careful as Christians about some of the wrong influences there might be going on with this sort of contamination, this mixture between light and darkness or however else we want to apply it as Paul has outlined it in 2 Corinthians here that we're looking at. But I've just listed some. The interfaith movement. How now we find in many services like in Westminster Abbey, even a church recently that opened itself during Ramadan, this church uh, for uh, Muslims to use. Uh, what fellowship can there be between light and darkness? Or between Christ and Belial? Martial arts, uh, most of them have something of the occult behind them. Certainly yoga has, it's Hinduism very clearly. And yet increasingly, even Christians sometimes are uh, being involved in that. The whole thing is actually opening up your body really to those uh, demonic forces, uh, to the other gods of the Hindus. Transcendental meditation, of course, again is Hinduism. Mindfulness, uh, so much talked about recently, comes from Buddhism. And then people have Buddhas in their garden. 
uh, scripture is very clear that we should not have anything uh, that is um, uh, defiled uh, in that way uh, within our homes and so on. I remember the prayer and Bible week saying, uh, uh, none of you would be so foolish as to have a Buddha in your house. And a lady came up to me afterwards, she said, I haven't got one, I've got two. Uh, she hadn't long been converted, but she saw nothing wrong in it. Uh, but when you have actually set up an idol, you're giving an invitation to those powers of darkness to come in. Actually, long ago when uh, we were praying against uh, a militant tendency, uh, we discovered that right on the top of uh, uh, the town hall in Liverpool is uh, the goddess Minerva. Uh, supposed to be that the, the council was looking for wisdom because she was the goddess of wisdom but uh, equated very much with Mars, uh, god of war. No wonder there was militant tendency there. In a sense, by setting that up inadvertently, uh, Thinking, we need wisdom, here's a symbol of wisdom. But you're actually setting up uh, uh, something of an idol. It's giving an opening to an enemy. I remember another occasion when a missionary was uh, sharing that he brought something back. I've forgotten what it was now. Just to demonstrate when he was on furlough, the sort of things, uh, I think it was something to do with witchcraft. And uh, his the baby, uh, they had a young baby, and the baby was constantly ill, and they couldn't uh, uh, understand what was wrong. And suddenly he realized this was something of the enemy that he had brought back. He repented of it, he threw it out, and the baby immediately made a, a, a recovery. We do not know, we don't realize sometimes just how the enemy gets an entrance through these things. So we do need to be very careful. Go on to other things such as spiritualism, fortune telling, even some of the uh, new age uh, fads in terms of diets and food and so on is bordering on uh, new age ideas and we need to be careful. Uh, vegetarianism uh, very often is because people are concerned about animals and so on. But also, uh, certainly in the past, not so much no, because there's much more of uh, thinking about cruelty to animals. But there was a Hindu influence coming through in, in that particular matter. And again, we're not always aware of these things. God made it very clear after the flood. He was giving us the, uh, the meat to, uh, to eat. Before that, it was only just uh, the, really before the whole flood, there was, uh, before the whole fall rather, uh, there was no uh, killing and so on in nature. Uh, but after the flood particularly, God uh, saw fit for us to have meat to eat. I don't know why. Uh, there may be some very good reason for it. But if God has said we are able to eat it, then I, I don't think we should go along with some Hindu practice or even uh, the thought of uh, cruelty to animals. Obviously, we want them to be killed in a, a, a proper manner and so on. But I think sometimes we can get these things out of proportion. If God has said it's all right, it's all right by me. And uh, uh, therefore, I think we should just, um, well... Examine why we are doing things. I'll just share something with you that uh, Dennis Clark shared years ago, and I, I don't know whether this is valid or not, but he said that uh, there was um, uh, somebody in India who had come out of Hinduism and uh, come to know the Lord, and uh, so he left behind all to do with Hinduism. But he did say that on one occasion when he was still in Hinduism, that every year he used to go in for that uh, fire-walking sort of cult uh, that they do. And this year, he had actually had some meat. And for the first time, he felt the heat as he went through that fire. And he was just wondering, by that he was saying really, the, the, the protection, the demonic protection that had been there before wasn't there that year. Now, Dennis Clark just threw that out as, uh, as an inquiry as to whether there was something there that God had given, even in eating meat. I don't know. I just passed that on as an observation that he and that Hindu had made uh, as a result of what happened to them. Then uh, in uh, Revelation chapter 3, again, it talks about defilement, and I think quite clearly, um, because of what is... Uh, what has gone before in the other passages of Scripture in, uh, in Revelation 2 
But in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 4 here it says, But you have a few people in Sardis who have not sold their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. But we know, of course, in uh, chapter 2, uh, Pergamum and Thyatira, again there was a mixture of uh, uh, things sacrificed to idols and immorality. And uh, here in chapter 3, the call is very much that they should wake up and uh, repent, for they had not completed any of their, uh, their deeds. They had not really progressed as Christians. Well, we don't know what was the real problem there. Uh, but there was that challenge. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not sold their garments or not defiled their garments, is the idea there. And they will walk or not stain their garments. Remember I said that matter of defilement had the idea of staining. And they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Well, thank God there is cleansing for sin. And then to Peter chapter 2 and uh, verse 20 Again, uh, the, there's the influence there of false teachers and how uh, they're turning grace into licentiousness. Something of the same matter that is mentioned in, in the book of Jude. Uh, it says there in chapter 2 and verse 2 of 2 Peter, 2 Peter 2.2, 2, 2, Many will follow their sensuality or licentiousness, matter of casting off restraint, and the whole thing there warns of that danger. And so when you come down to verse 20, it says, For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are engaged again entangled in them and are overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would be better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn away from the holy commandment handed on to them. It has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit, and a sow after washing returns to wallowing in the mire. It's one of those passages that seems to suggest very clearly that it is possible to lose our, our salvation. Their state is worse than it was in the beginning. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of salvation, it says. So it's a, uh, it's a warning that false teachers can lead us down such a path so that in the end we say it doesn't matter how I live. I can just do what I like and God will forgive me. Well, if we go on sinning, there's nothing but uh, a consuming fire, as the writer to the Hebrew says. If we go on deliberately sinning, that doesn't matter that sometimes, doesn't mean that sometimes we do slip up and do perhaps deliberately tell a lie for some reason. Well, when we confess that, that's fine. But if we just go on living in the same old way, there is no forgiveness for sin. As the writer to the Hebrews says it, we're, we're basically rejecting what Jesus has done. Look at Hebrews 10 uh, again, if you don't believe me. And then Matthew uh, 15 uh, and verse 11. Uh, Jesus there really is talking about uh, they're all that concerned about the ceremony of law, washing of hands and washing of cups and so on, uh, and, uh, uh, and all the regulations about food. And Jesus points out it's not uh, what goes into a man, but what comes out of him, what comes from his heart. That's what really defiles. And Jesus was really putting the record straight and the emphasis straight. So he says there, it is not what enters into the mouth that defiles the man, but what proceeds out of the mouth. This defiles the man. In other places he talks about what comes, uh, 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 well it goes on, verse 19, For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, slanders. These are the things which defile the man. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile the man. Their ceremonial law said it did. But Jesus said that's not the real problem. It's the heart that is the real problem. So again, we just need to make sure that we need to free ourselves from every defilement, uh, as uh, we're seeing here, from every defilement of, um, how was it put again? From all defilement of flesh and spirit, performing holiness in the fear of God.
So just in closing, how about having a quick spiritual checkup? Any hindrance in our lives? Remember the, uh, the writer to the Hebrews talked about laying aside every sin which so easily uh, uh, besets us. Those things that would keep on tripping us up. Are there any wrong involvements? I've mentioned some tonight. Things that uh, perhaps are just borderline even. Or is it giving the enemy something of a loophole? Is it trying to have fellowship with darkness as well as light? Just going into enemy territory in some way. Any defilements? 2 Timothy 2 and verse 20 talks about if uh, uh, there are um, vessels for honor and for dishonor. And uh, those that basically want to serve the Lord will uh, cleanse themselves uh, from all the defiles, if we can put it that way. Now in a large house there are not only gold and silver vessels, but also vessels of wood and earthenware, and some to honor and some to dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful to the Master, prepared for every good work. So again, are we seeking to cleanse ourselves, to truly walk in holiness? And then just that matter that we've been reminded of perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord, going on to complete holiness. The Apostle Paul, that was very much his aim, and uh, most of us are very familiar with uh, Philippians chapter 3, as he sets goals for his own life. I wonder what goals we've set for our lives. Uh, perhaps even as we're having a church weekend, we might just take stock and next weekend perhaps ask him what sort of goals are we setting in our lives for spiritual development, if we can put it that way. He talks about uh, wanting to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained it or already become perfect. I'm glad in one sense the Apostle Paul said that. Not gloating over the fact that he failed, but uh, you know, sometimes when we, we do fail ourselves and we perhaps are whipping ourselves a bit for it, just to remember too, the Apostle Paul had to say that he hadn't yet become perfect. But he didn't leave it there, because that, his goal was to press on. Not that I have already obtained it or already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Jesus took us hold for perfection. It wasn't just to save us from sin, but actually to, to bring perfection into our lives. And so he continues, Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God, in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore as many as are perfected or mature. Have this attitude. So just again coming back to where we started uh, this evening. With all those marvelous promises. And with the fact that God wants a clear separation. Between light and darkness. Between anything that is of the enemy. And anything that is God. That clear separation. And having those marvelous promises that He will be a Father to us, that He will welcome us, that He wants to dwell amongst us, we need to make sure that uh, we cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit. Just some of those areas uh, that are dodgy spiritually, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Well, may the Lord help us to press on toward that, that mark and that high calling that we have in Christ, that heavenly calling to be increasingly ready uh, for our dwelling in heaven uh, when, when we go to be Him, or that uh, new Jerusalem when Jesus returns to this earth. Well, that's the challenge for us. How well are you doing spiritually? Are you pressing on? Or have you been backsliding a bit? Are you involved in dubious things? Have you even come to know the Lord so that you're on the journey in the first place and really committed your life to Him so that you might truly know God as your Father because you come in repentance and faith?
knowing that Jesus died for your sin and to bring you eternal life. But may the Lord help us all as we seek truly to follow him. Father, we ask again as we've considered some of these things, if there needs to be a little bit of examination in our lives, if some things need to go by the board, some dubious matters, we pray that we might truly leave them behind. But Lord, we know for all of us uh, there is still sin that contaminates our life from time to time. Lord, if we're in Christ, we thank you that we know that our sin is forgiven and we can ask for forgiveness And that uh, the blood of Jesus Christ does cleanse from all unrighteousness when we confess that sin. But Lord, more than that, we don't want to keep on coming confessing sin. We want to be perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Recognize that you're a holy God and you have called us with a holy calling. Help us then, Lord, we pray, to become more and more like you and more and more like your Son. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.